This is the Post Shift Podcast, a raw look at the hospitality industry. Welcome to another episode of the Post Shift Podcast. Of course, I'm your host, Sean Sewell. Um, if you haven't noticed, every single day of the week, uh, for the last two weeks or last week and a half right now, um, I've had an episode a day from Monday to Friday um, with people in the industry who are making changes, whether it be initiatives with the government, government agencies, um, or, oh, sorry, NGOs mainly, but i um, been talking to a lot of people about how they're seeing the long-term effects of COVID-19 on the province and the country's hospitality industry, which is all I talk about, and it is um, humbling to listen to a lot of people who know way more than I do and are plugged in way more than I am, um, not sort of still understanding the light, light at the end of the tunnel. So the reason why I'm doing this episode today is that a lot of people keep asking me about the macro, like what's going to happen in three months time? What's what's the plan? What's the light at the end of the tunnel? So on and so forth. And to be honest with how much information is constantly coming down, like daily provincial and daily federal, weekly federal um, announcements and relief funds and money coming down the pipeline and EI and CRB, CERB and so on and so forth here in the province. For me, I'm just trying to exist right now and maximize what I can do right now from a work standpoint, from an advice standpoint. Um, long term, I'm not sure. Uh, I took a drive downtown the other day. I see a lot of restaurants, a lot of retail stores just boarded up and brown papered up. Whether or not they are going to open again is a, a different story. So, um, I thought today I want to do an episode of five things as an operator you should be doing right now. Now, this is five things that I think you should be doing. There's plenty of lists out there. There's tons of lists out there. But I sort of narrowed it down to five things, I think, in the micro that you should be doing to try and stay alive, just try and stay open, to try and stay existing, everything. So let's kick off. Now, I've tried to number these into like a one to five in um, uh, importance, I suppose. But... Really, it's a one to five list. Um, so, first things first, you've got to talk to your landlord. You've got to have that all the conversation with your landlord about paying rent. I know April 1st is just gone. I heard, saw a whole bunch of messages and Facebook posts and social media posts about April 1st coming and going. Um, but have an open dialogue with your landlord um, because at the end of the day, any sort of um, crushed relationship or bad relationship you have now is going to continue on long after COVID-19 is gone, long after the media goes back to normal, so on and so forth. So you want to have a good relationship with your landlord now. And if you haven't had a good relationship with your landlord, you better be bu- um, um, buttoning it up because at the end of the day, it's a it's a 50-50 split. You as, an, as a tenant don't want to get kicked out. You don't want to be evicted. Um, but a landlord also wants to keep you in there. Well, landlord should want to keep you in there because at the end of the day, the re- rental market is going to commercial rental market is going to ask is going to fall out of it after all this because if landlords stick to their guns and just ask for full rent, they're not going to have anyone to rent to because there won't be new business. Um, so I think April first was sort of like a I heard a lot of landlords just going hard and fast like no you got to fucking pay your rent. Um, I think come May first that that tune may change aggressively, but. Opening up a dialogue with your um, landlord, telling them how much you can pay um, is the first thing you need to do. If it's zero, it's zero. If it's 25%, it's 25%. Like, um, but keep in mind, deferment is deferment. Deferment means you have to pay it later. So having a, a deferred lease now or a deferred rental payment now just means you have to pay for it later. So we have to keep in mind as operators, this whole deferment thing, which I've heard a lot of people going, yay. I'm like, deferment of taxes, deferment of lease, deferment of all these things, you have to pay it six months down the track, 12 months down the track. So when you're just getting on your feet, you're going to get hit with these extra bills. And just when you start putting a little bit of cash into the bank at the and getting a little bit of bottom line going, you're going to be forking out more money. So always keep in mind, like try and think 12 months in the future, because this is going to keep going for a while. Um, and we're not going to cover as an industry for a really long time. Now, past your landlord, talk to anybody you own, you owe, a fixed amount to every single month. So BC Hydro, Fortis, um, telephone, uh, credit card processing, your POS rental, all these things. Try and, no, I'm not saying try and get a zero amount. I'm just saying trying to negotiate a smaller amount just so you can bring your break-even points down. Like your break-even point, how much it costs you to open the doors every day, you want to try and reduce that as much as possible. And of course, labor is not as big a factor as it, is, as it was before. But our next, my next point is number two, devise a solid 
diverse takeout plan. This is a big one. In BC and most of the provinces here in the in uh, Canada, you're allowed to do takeout food, delivery, and alcohol sales off-site. <laughs> now, obviously, the alcohol sales, you can't do mixed cocktails. You have to do full bottles, which, to be honest, I've done a program with Pagliacci's, and it's been very, very popular. People are coming in and buying $90 uh, Negroni kits and stuff like that. It's kind of crazy, but it's also awesome. But devise a diverse and um, doable takeout plan so that you can make a smidge of money. It's it's about doing everything you can possibly do to make money and to try and keep your business afloat. Now, when you say af- when I say afloat, I don't mean afloat financially because to go is not going to be the answer. We need more. We need relief. But from a branding and marketing point of view, it is a big part of keeping your brand alive during this time. Shutting down your doors and just going silent on social media people will remember that. And it, it's not a bad thing in people's consciousness. They'll remember places that they could get food through this time. And this is going to go on for three months. Like I think a lot of restaurants shut down first thing when um, first thing when they thought it was going to be a three to four week thing or a six week thing. Now it's going to be 12 weeks, at least 12 weeks. So I think div- div- devising a diverse and strategic takeout plan is a huge, huge effort. Be creative, get creative. Like, be awesome at it. Um, at least it's bringing some money in through the door so that you can at least pay those people that I just talked about a smidge, a little bit. Like, just just try and build out a good uh, takeout plan and be diverse drinks and wine and stuff like that. So, that brings me to my next point. Number three, your marketing strategy. Now, if you do a takeout plan, you've got a marketing strategy right there. So, Start doing a video a day of a dish. Have the chef cook one up and you film it. Um, take photos, do stills, and, and just post. You just want to keep everybody thinking about what you're doing and what they can get from you and these things. And so um, this is a big one. And marketing and branding comes back to as well. Like I've heard a lot of restaurants say that their brand doesn't specific, uh, doesn't fit into a takeout delivery model because of the way it, it's pleated and da-da-da-da-da. The way your restaurant existed three weeks ago no longer exists. And if it does exist afterwards, kudos, but the chances of your restaurant existing the way it was in 12 weeks time is a very, very slim to none chance that a restaurant that doesn't do takeout and doesn't keep its marketing and branding machine going through this time, you won't exist. The time to understand that the restaurant industry has changed dramatically, aggressively, uh, saddenly, <laughs> saddenly, I'm not even sure that's a word, but the, the, the time to understand that the hospitality industry has changed so aggressively in the last three weeks is now. The way that we did things three weeks ago as restaurant tours, as operators, as an industry needs to be fixed, does not exist, and we need to move forward innovating, creating a, a new brand, a new market. So if you're telling me that your food isn't to goable, then you need to change your menu. Tweak your menu to pick things, pick five or six things that are easy to do, takeout worthy, they plate okay, they can put into a to-go box, and everybody wins. Please don't tell me that you can't devise a menu out of the things that you have on your menu that can be a to-go item or a delivery item or a pickup item. These are big things. Branding and marketing. Once you get your takeout order, going back to that, once you get your takeout orders done, start doing Facebook marketing. Facebook marketing is super cheap. So is Instagram. They're both really cheap. It's to a point where you can do a $5 a day for the rest of this little while, $5 a day, and ping the exact area that your delivery service goes to and ping 1,500 to 2,500 people in Victoria. If you're in Vancouver, that number's going to slide straight up. So for $5 a day, you can do a ton of work. We're doing 120, uh, sorry, 12, 12 weeks. So you've got a chunk of coin going out, but the amount of money you can get back on delivery service is huge. Instagram, whenever you do an Instagram post or an Instagram story, you can promote that, pick, like put it to a, a specific target market, and you can actually turn um, a picture on Instagram of your food, of your staff, of a drink peak feature, of anything into a very, very focused marketing tool. So like these are simple things. SMM, you can reach out to me if you want. I can walk you through it. No problems at all. Um, just reach out to me and I can do it for you. No problems at all. So number four, 
Number four. Um, your main role right now, after you've talked to your landlord, talked to your creditors, done all these things, is to turn as much of your inventory into cash as possible. Now, I've had a lot of conversations with people about wine prices and wine costs and all sorts of stuff. Like, how much do I charge for my wine? I'm like, if you make 10% profit on top of a bottle of wine, that's better than the bottle of wine sitting there making interest on your credit card. So these are the things you're starting to make. If you've got 40 grand worth of inventory right now, your main goal is to turn that 40 grand into, and then talking about liquor and wine, which a lot of restaurants are sitting on, turning that into pure cash flow, putting cash in the bank as much as possible. 10%, 15% above costs is a way that you can do that. You're going to burn through your inventory. You don't need to reorder. There's no need to reorder. You can just shrink your menu until you've got nothing left. But you need to burn through your cash, your inventory to create cash flow for your business, um, to pay your bills, to do all these things. Because by the time you get out of fees for your delivery service and that sort of stuff, you are still already running a very slim margin. So any inventory, food included, anything like get your stuff. If you're, if you're, um, uh, if your chefs want to make a feature, do a feature for your takeout menu that night. Use up stuff that you've got sitting around. Try Because most of it's sitting on credit cards. Very many, very rarely do restaurants put anything on COD. All you want to do is turn all your inventory to cash flow as quickly as possible. That's an easy one. <laughs> Number five, the last one. Number five, the last one. Um, be careful with your money. Now... Why I'm saying this is that there's a lot of relief coming down the pipeline for restaurants and bars, 40 grand, um, interest-free, da-da-da, forgivable for 10, all of these things are wonderful, great things. But what you need to do is you need to set yourself a six-month plan and then spread any money you get in, big chunks, like I'm not talking about the cash flow and that sort of thing, big chunks of money you get in over the next two, three weeks, four weeks, month, over the next six months, because that's how long it's going to be before you can recover. And so... If you, try, if you get that $40,000 loan, you bang it out in a week, it's not going to do you any help. Is it going to help you in three months' time? Most definitely. So sit down with your accountant, with your finance person, whoever like looks at your cash flow. Sit down, pick a six-month point that you think that you'll be able to reopen fully, full houses on Friday night, that sort of thing, because that's going to, consumer confidence is going to take a long time to get back. And then spread that money out. Now, I know it's hard to spread forty grand out over six months, but any money that comes down the tube from the government needs to be spread out over six to 12 months at least. So watch your sense, um, what are, what is like, um, watch the sense the dollars will go after themselves. So keep your costs low, turn that, that, uh, that inventory into cash flow. Just keep plugging away any money you get from the government, spread the fucker out over as long as you can. So that is my five things operators should be doing right now. Do I have all the answers? Absolutely fucking not. Right now, I am just trying to get information from as many people as I can and mold my opinions to that. But that's my five pieces of advice in the micro for an operator to do right like right now when they're listening to go into their venue and op- do the operations. That's my five pieces of advice. So I hope you're enjoying the episodes that I'm putting out, guys. This whole week is just jam-packed with epic in- uh, interviews. I've got Sh- Trevor Bird. I've got um, Ian Tortison from the BCRFA. I've got so many people coming up. Um, lots of live feeds, uh, lots of live streams on my uh, SHC Instagram. So keep an eye out for that as well. Hope you're well, guys. If you ever, ever need anything, um, I was gutted driving downtown the other day with brown paper and thing. If you just want to talk and vent, I've had a few operators reach out to me and just want to talk and vent, please reach out to me. Um, I'll be there for you. I'll take a phone call. I'll FaceTime. I'll do whatever you need, let you rant, give you my two cents, and hopefully balance it out a little bit so thanks a lot guys thanks for the support i'll see you next week have a good week whatever you guys are doing if you need anything again just hit me up chat you soon bye thanks for listening pro shifters i well, hope you enjoyed that episode i really enjoy sitting down with friends and peers and uh, just chatting about the industry and getting down to the nuts and bolts of what's really going on out there uh, make sure you like subscribe comment everything on all the platforms just hit it up and i'll do my best to answer any queries or questions you have i'll see you next week guys bye